Welcome everybody to Pickleball Noise Relief. This is our Zoom call for uh, the first half of the month. We have been uh, gathering friends across the country ever since my friend Rob Mastriani launched a Facebook group called Pickleball Noise Relief. And uh, he asked me to be the West Coast Administrator. My name is Nalani Lazowitz. And uh, Rob, it's been a month and we have over 100 members in our group. What does that tell you? No, it's great. It's really fantastic. And uh, I didn't really think that that was actually possible. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that we broke away a little bit to uh, get some peace and quiet uh, from the deniers um, that, uh, that seem to not really believe it's a problem. We're, we're putting a spotlight on these trouble spots, you know, and uh, we are. We're amplifying it. We're exposing it. Uh, I think a little bit of shame and embarrassment is good as well, you know, uh, for motivation. I, it, it really, it's important. And so we, we are building a coalition. I never thought of myself as an activist, but here we are yeah. uh, linking people across the country. So after, after a couple of years of this, I've discovered I'm a noise activist. I never realized it before, but noise pollution is a very serious issue worldwide. The more I study this issue, the more I realize it impacts a lot of people, not just in sports. So we're going to, uh, round out our, our little intro here by, by uh, bringing you Dr. Lance Willis. Uh, Lance helped us so much in our community by doing a noise impact study. Um, unfortunately, our city council have completely disregarded it and they found a different consultant who uses different protocols. And so Lance is here to describe, you know, what his approach, what their approach is to studying the potential sound impact uh, of pickleball. Lance, um, really glad to see you and uh, welcome welcome to our call. Thanks for, for being here and maybe you could tell us a little bit about your company and then go right into your presentation. Okay, sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm the Principal Acoustical Engineer at Spindarian in Willis Acoustics and Noise Control. Uh, my partner is uh, Tom Spindarian, he's an architect. And uh, so he kind of handles the indoor side and I'm more the outdoor guy. Uh, for handling uh, noise issues. And uh, so that's just basically what we do. We do a lot of site planning in, uh, in regard to different types of facilities. Can you briefly describe your process that you go through? You, somebody gives you an address and then what? Uh, yeah, that's typically what I'll ask for first. It's just an address for the pickleball course if there's a complaint. I assume that's what you mean. Um, yeah, so first of all, I want to look at the uh, satellite imagery and just see uh, what is around the pickleball courts and what kind of setbacks they have. Um, and of course, then from there, I may want to get some pictures of the site so I can see what the topography is like, because uh, elevation differences can uh, uh, you know, change the way that uh, you know, noise abatement works, if there is noise abatement on the site. Excellent. So the slides are loaded. Just let me know uh, what, when you want me to go to the next one. Okay. So, yeah. So what I wanted to cover on this was just a, a basic, you know, description of what noise assessments are uh, in regard to pickleball courts and how to understand one if, say, the city where you are uh, hires a consultant to produce a noise impact study or some pickleball courts. Uh, you know, what does it mean? What do, what do the numbers in that report mean? And I'll go over a few. First place um, to talk about is uh, you know, just what is the pickleball sound? What people mainly complain about is the popping sound from the paddles, which is uh, a short duration uh, impact process. And you can see that in the top figure on the right. That's the the, the, the time trace of what the sound pressure looks like as it's radiated from the paddle. Uh, so you have a, a very sudden onset. It's a short duration signal. This is one of the shorter ones. It's about two milliseconds in duration. And there, there's a little bit of uh, decay afterwards. And so that's the direct signal. Then there, there will usually be a number of reflections that come in after that. So it does extend out uh, further in time, but this is 
mainly what we're concerned about here is this uh, initial impulse, which is very short. Uh, under the ANSI S12.9 Part 4 standard, this would be defined as highly impulsive, meaning that it generally results from an impact process like the collision of two bodies or the sudden uh, discharge of gas, like it could be small arms fire, uh, the discharge of an air brake, something like that. Uh, so these are these are sounds that had generally produce a lot of energy in the most, uh, most uh, sensitive range of human hearing and also have a, a sudden onset. This can sometimes uh, uh, trigger a startle response. Uh, it, it's in that, um, frequency band where you have consonants and a lot of information is in that band, which is why it's so distracting. And in the bottom of that is the, uh, is the sound intensity spectrum. And it's, it's very narrow band. If you look at that one peak that's just above a thousand hertz there, yeah, that one. That's where most of the energy is. There's a little bit of low frequency energy too, uh, but that popping sound in the, the perception of pitch that you have is in that peak. So since we're dealing with impulsive sound, it's very important to consider the psychological factors that affect the noise impact in addition to simply the loudness or what you might measure with an A-weighted average sound pressure level, something like the equivalent continuous sound pressure level, LAEQ. Um, in general, averaging techniques do not work well for impulsive sound, uh, particularly highly impulsive sound, because the duration is so short. When you try to average, you spread that energy out over a long period of time, and it makes it look like it's a lot less than it is. Uh, so averaging techniques will underestimate the noise impact. And the process that we use is defined under uh, ANSI standard at S12.9. It's in part four of that series of standards. Uh, that's the American National Standards Institute uh, is a publisher of that standard. And it is a, a quantitative assessment of annoyance caused by noise. It's based on uh, listening tests, it's, uh, you know, peer reviewed studies of a jury of listeners exposed to different types of sound, different classifications, uh, could be impulsive sound, tonal sound, other sounds with special characteristics, uh, which are not necessarily neutral, like um, um, traffic noise, for instance. That's kind of the baseline that we try to normalize to. Now, if you see a noise uh, assessment study, uh, it, it may contain it, other metrics that are not, you know, not part of the ANSI standard, but are uh, sometimes part of a noise ordinance or uh, just what the acoustical consultant chooses to use. Uh, but it, I've got some uh, averaging metrics here listed that will cause some issues when you're trying to get an accurate assessment of the noise impact for pickleball. Uh, the first one is the equivalent continuous sound pressure level. Uh, it's often abbreviated as LEQ. This is an average over the entire period of a measurement. Uh, it could be two minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, you know, whatever uh, is chosen. And so all that energy gets spread out over that period of time from these, you know, brief uh, impulses. And so quite often when this is done, it is not even possible to dis distinguish the sound from the pickleball courts from the background noise level, you know, which is you know, obviously not congruent with what is experienced by people on the site. Uh, another one is uh, L-max. Uh, this is the maximum fast exponential time weighted sound pressure level. And what that means is that it is a running average of the sound pressure level with a, a relatively short uh, time constant, 125 milliseconds, 
But as I said, you can see on the figure on the on the right, these impulses are often as short as two milliseconds. That's two orders of magnitude shorter than the averaging time of even this fast time waiting filter. So that is um, is going to attenuate what you're trying to measure. Is is basically the issues with this uh, fast time waiting filter is a smoothing filter. That's what it's intended to do. It's intended to remove short transients in the signal so that you can get a more you know, a smoother average of what uh, what is going on. So that's obviously problematic if you're trying to measure something that has a high peak pressure but a short duration. And also do not confuse L max with a peak sound pressure level. Uh, peak sound pressure level is instantaneous the, the ma L max is the maximum of an average over a period of time. And, and the last one is one that you don't see that often, but you do run into it sometimes in noise codes still. Uh, the percentile sound pressure levels are the level that's exceeded during a certain per per uh, percentage of the measurement. For example, L10, as it's designated, is a level that gets exceeded 10% of the time of the measurement. Uh, L01 is the level succeeded by during one percent of the measurement so that's um the percentile sound pressure levels are normally calculated from a fast exponential time weighted filter output so they suffer from all the same shortcomings as l max but uh, there's also a few other issues which i won't go into now but yeah and so here's just an example of using LMAX properly. This is a, uh, a sound burst uh, represented by the red curve. It starts at time equals zero. It rises immediately to its um, operating level at one. It continues for a period of time, in this case, 277 milliseconds, and then it shuts off and goes back to zero. The blue curve is the output of the fast exponential time averaging filter. Uh, and as you can see, it starts at zero, but it rises more gradually and it reaches its peak value when the sound source shuts off and then it decays. That, uh, actually, can you go back? That maximum value that it reaches in this case is one half dB below the true value of the signal. And it takes 277 milliseconds for the fast time waiting filter to, to reach that level of accuracy. That's about two time constants. Now, if you go to the next slide, this is what happens when you try to use LMAX with a pickleball paddle impact. Notice that the time scale is much shorter here. I had to do that for clarity. Uh, whereas the, the previous slide was uh, zero to one second, this is zero to 10 milliseconds. So it's a hundred times shorter um, than in the other case. So in, in this case, the, uh, the signal rises to its um, steady state level uh, and stays there for two milliseconds, then it cuts off. And after two milliseconds, the fast exponential time averaging filter output has only risen to a level that is 18 dB below the true level of the, um, of the sound pressure. Uh, so that, that is a large measurement error. And unfortunately, it's unavoidable when using these types of metrics, this is, which is why I recommend using the procedure in the ANSI standard, which is not an averaging technique, is based on sound exposure level, looking at individual uh, acoustical events so that you get a much more representative uh, assessment of the noise impact. It also takes into account psychological factors where this also does not do that. Uh, Lance, um, so, I mean, is, is it correct to say that the, uh, that the standards haven't caught up with uh, what we're actually uh, hearing, you know, like people are telling us it's not that loud, but we actually hear it uh, 350 feet away, 500 feet away. You know, I think there's a, there's a disconnect. 
Yeah. Does, do the standards need to catch up to, is there a disconnect at this point? Is there disagreement among the sound engineers? I would not About say, that, well, I would not say that there's a disconnect between the standards and what we're trying to measure. Uh, I think more research could be done to maybe fine tune the standards uh, a little better for this type of sound. But what what we have is, is pretty good. I get pretty good results with this. And when I do noise abatement plans based on this process, it in most cases, it solves the problem. I, I don't really have to go back and try to deal with additional noise complaints if the noise abatement is installed uh, the way that I specified. <coughs> now, the, the real disconnect is between noise regulation and the current state of research. The uh, noise regulation typically lags at least 30 to 40 years behind what we actually know about assessing noise. I mean, that's kind of where we're at now. And that's that's the real issue. There is... Um, so it's kind of a, today's a, modern world is not... It can't seem to conform to these standards that were set 20, 30 years ago. It's, it's more an issue that they have just never been implemented. Everyone kind of seems to want to do things the old way. And that's fine if you're measuring a roadway. But it does not work well for impulsive sound. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the fantastic presentation. Uh, I have a, a couple questions. Uh, I live in Wellesley. Um, Rob introduced me to this group, uh, and we live approximately 30 feet from our property line to a, t uh, a now converted from tennis to pickleball court. Uh, and uh, first question is, how does the sound of a pickleball at that proximity um, compare to small, ar small arms fire? Uh, and... Um, and the second question uh, would be, uh, what are your thoughts and opinions on how tennis and pickleball have been conflated to the extent that uh, pickleball, tennis courts are being converted into pickleball, but they're obviously very different beasts. Right. Uh, and this like, sort of uh, uh, conflating between the two has allowed this, this, this whole problem to happen because infrastructure that was previously geared for tennis, which is much quieter, is now used for pickleball. Yeah. Um, in regards to small arms fire, I haven't done a lot of comparative studies with that. Uh, those uh, shooting ranges typically have their own uh, noise regulations specifically for them. And it's something we don't really handle a lot of. Um, but it, it is a lot louder. You know, the, the sound power is a lot higher. I should, I should phrase it that way, because loudness is really a function of distance. Uh, so the, the issue is not how loud a, a sound source is close to the source. The issue is how loud it is at the point of observation, which is your house. Uh, so when we, when we talk about being in the same category, like pickleball being in the same category as small arms fire, it's a characterization of the waveform that that source produces. It's short in duration. It has a high peak pressure level. It has significant frequency in our significant sound pressure in the frequency band where we're, our hearing is most sensitive, where we're most you know, accustomed to um, pulling information out of speech and getting other information out of our environment, which is what makes it so distra distracting. Now, uh, yeah, I was just going to talk about the uh, the equivalence between uh, tennis and pickleball. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, what I think what this is driven by, um, where I've heard this most often has been in uh, town council meetings where the the city uh, city attorney will say that you know well we've designated this piece of land as a park it's um, you know it's ordained for recreational activities therefore any recreational activity that we want to put in this park is exempt from the noise code because it, it, it the sound is necessary for the use that we've you know designated for this land. Um, and so I, 
I see that argument made a lot, especially in regard to tennis courts. And they'll say, well, we've had tennis courts for a while. Therefore, we should be able to convert those to pickleball. And since it's a recreational area, there shouldn't be an issue with that. It's kind of circular logic, but uh, that's that's kind of how I've seen that argument raised a lot. It's usually by an attorney. Yes. What would be the decibel level at the uh, point of impact? I mean, is it is it at 100 or? Well, it's. Yeah, it's a little hard to say. Um, I haven't actually tried to measure it, but it's going to be influenced by the fact that the sound radiated from these paddles is directional. And the position that the paddle is held in at the moment that it contacts the ball, the plane of the paddle is it's almost going uh, you know, through the head of the player. So they're kind of in a null where the, the sound is not as high. You know, it, the sound going in that direction is not as intense as it is, um, say, perpendicular to the face of the paddle. So it, that may actually protect the players somewhat. And I, my question is more about the local ordinances seem to be tied to decibel level readings. Is there another way to interpret the noise that um, would be helpful to those who are in that type of situation? Yeah, that's uh, noise ordinances are difficult. Yeah, they are generally not helpful for impulsive sound. Like very few of them even address it. And I've never seen one, except for the one in Oro Valley that I helped them write, that um, that actually address highly impulsive sound in a way that is meaningful. Uh, so, yeah, for the, for the noise ordinances, I, I I tend to look at it more of a as a nuisance issue than trying to show that you're either in compliance or not in compliance with some. Uh, noise ordinance that was never intended to address this type of sound. And, and that's kind of a common problem. So you end up trying to shoehorn your analysis into this framework that cannot accommodate this type of sound. And it, it, it just, it, it's not productive. Uh, so I, I really look at it in terms of, um, of, of nuisance where you can rely on you know, actual standards that were written by people that were experts in noise assessment that have read the research and have based their measurement protocols and assessment protocols on studies that have actually been done to see how people react to different types of sound. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, one of somebody had mentioned earlier about how some pickleball players actually enjoy the sound. I can tell you as as a pickleball player, I found it melodic initially. And then once we started having six courts going 15 hours a day, that's when and, and it started waking me up because it, my bedroom window overlooks the courts. That's when I'm like, whoa. And, and most pickleball players, they don't get it. They, they just don't get it. You almost have to be a player and live across the courts to really understand it. That said, a lot of the stuff I'm reading, and this is a question for Lance, a lot of the stuff that I've been reading up on, they really talk about pickleball sound in general. And what I've discovered as a player is there's really two different styles of play. There's the, you know, you're up at the kitchen and you're playing real, you know, they're, they're short games and they're not as aggressive. We, I have found, and my neighbors have found, that the evening crew, crew the 20s and 30-some-year-olds, are going out there with more of a tennis style, which is, you know, mm. slamming the ball from the back of the court, which is, I find to be much louder and much more, it's that aggressive play. And I've, I haven't seen anybody do any kind of write-up on, like, the differences in the sound, because if if a sound engineer came out with, with the 55 plus group, they wouldn't, you know, it, it, the decibel readings aren't that high. But if you did it at night with these, these young kids that are slamming it, it's a completely different ball game. That's a great comparison. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I've seen that in uh, the measurements that I've done as well. Um, 
Yeah, what, what I do is is measurements, you know, which I, I would call an aggregate measurement, which is to mean that I go out and, and just measure people playing on the courts and they can play in different styles. They have all different kinds of equipment that they bring with them, uh, different types of paddles, whatever they like to use, you know, their favorite ball. Um, what I've found after doing all those measurements is that when I look at the sound exposure level of those individual paddle impacts, and I, and I take the average value of that, and, and I uh, uh, compensate that for the distance where the measurement was made from the courts and the ground type and all the other environmental factors, the mean sound exposure level that I measure at all these different courts is remarkably similar which says to me that on as a, on the average, as a whole, people are bringing equipment to the courts that is for the most part, pretty similar. Um, you know, from court to court, it, 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 you know, there's probably you know, a few paddles that are really popular and that's what most people are using. And so what I measure is really, I, I'm really there to characterize the area around the courts more than I am the actual players on the courts, because what I what I measure from them is pretty consistent. There are sometimes some differences uh, at different locations, just because of the topography. It could be because of the ground around the courts it could have some uh, effect it, if the ground is uneven. Sometimes that can break up the ground wave, and that causes uh, differences in propagation. So that's that's mainly what I'm there to study when I'm doing measurements on, on the course, because I already have a lot of data on pickleball and I don't necessarily need a lot more data on the paddles to understand uh, what's going to happen at a given location, as long as I can be confident that I can uh, you know, anticipate what the, the ground effects are gonna be. Lance, I wanted to uh, go over a case study. This is a Southern California uh, area a mobile home yep. installation and I know you did the the impact study on this one as you can see uh, there's already a tennis court here which is built and they've built a pickleball court here and now they're talking about another pickleball court can you just walk us through how you go about how you went about analyzing this and, and what your conclusion was yeah well I, this is a good example of a site that I would not recommend for pickleball. It's, you know, first of all, obviously the courts are very close to the houses on, you know, on either side. Um, yeah, so setback, you know, right from the beginning, setback is going to be an issue with this. This is a site that it really wouldn't be possible to design a noise abatement plan for in terms of open air pickleball courts, just because of the distance. Uh, there are also some elevation differences on this court and you can't see it from the satellite view, but the houses on one side are several feet, maybe you know, four or five feet higher than the playing surface of the courts. So that's an additional factor. And I believe in this case, there were some, uh, kind of decks, I think the decks were raised a little bit off the ground and maybe some patios that were even on the ground, but the ground was elevated where you could stand on this deck and, and look over the fence down onto the pickleball courts. And, you know, I, obviously a fence cover is not going to be effective in that situation because it, it doesn't block the line of sight. Uh, there are some additional challenges that you would run into in trying to do noise abatement for this court. Uh, you notice that you have houses on three sides and they're all fairly close. So you would need uh, noise abatement on, on at least three sides, which means you're gonna have at least one pair of surfaces that are facing each other. And if you use a reflective material or that noise barrier, or whether it be um, a massillated vinyl product like a fence cover, which we call MLB, 
or a freestanding wall, even a masonry wall is fairly reflective. It's more uh, absorptive than uh, MLB, but it's still fairly reflective. What happens in that case is you get sound bouncing back and forth between those parallel surfaces. It has nowhere to go. It can't really dissipate because there's nothing to absorb it. And so most of it just ends up going over the top of the barrier anyway. And, and sometimes in situations like this, you can actually create new noise issues in locations where there wasn't a noise issue before you installed the, the noise abatement. So you, you really have to think about where you install noise barriers strategically, because it is more helpful to think of a noise barrier not so much as a sound blocker, but a sound redirector because it will block sound going in one direction, but it's going to redirect it into another direction. So, so then you have to think about what is going to happen uh, once you install this barrier, what's going to happen with in, in uh, the other locations around the sound source. Excellent. So we have a, a question from Marin. Um, yes, I was wondering about the um, impact of the additional loud sounds of the players screaming, shouting during the game, along with the impact of the ball. Right. Um, what I found in practice is that a properly designed noise abatement plan that will uh, attenuate the, the paddle impacts to an acceptable level will also work for the speech. When you have noise complaints regarding speech from pickleball courts, it's more often related to the content of the speech rather than how loud it is. Not uh, a... <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think in, in your case though, uh, it, the courts really couldn't be abated adequately right. anyway. Right. So, yeah, so, you know, so what I'm saying, though, is that if you have a noise abatement plan that is adequate for the paddles, it should also be adequate for the speech. But if it's not adequate for the paddles, it may not be adequate for the speech either. Thank you. I wonder if this is um, if you want to speak a little bit about the types of noise barriers when you talk about mitigation. Uh, sure, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, Noise abatement for pickleball mostly comes down to installing some type of noise barrier around the courts. And that usually takes the form of either a freestanding wall, like a masonry wall, or a fence cover. And kind of examples that we you know, tend to recommend for that are uh, verticrete, which is a prefabricated concrete wall system. Uh, it's fairly cost effective. Um, you know, it, it, as far as like a permanent um, masonry wall installation, that's that's one of the cheaper options. And it also looks uh, nice, too. You, it comes out of a mold, so it can look like just about anything you want it to look like, a, you know, a brick wall or a stone wall or uh, however you want it to look. Uh, mass loaded vinyl fence covers are also an option. Uh, you do have to be careful about wind loading when you attach those to a fence, but uh, they they can be effective in certain situations, but you do have to be aware that they are very reflective and you have to take that into account in positioning them. Uh, we've talked about parallel walls. Um, as far as the specification for what would be an acceptable noise barrier, uh, we go by sound transmission class with pickleball because it's mainly high frequency sound and STC is inappropriate measure of sound insulation uh, for this type of sound source. And so the minimum we'd want to see is STC 20. Uh, that's pretty easy to meet. Uh, the, the purpose of that is just to make sure that most of the sound is going over the top of the barrier and you don't have much sound going through the barrier. Because obviously if you have sound going through the noise barrier, then it's not really serving much of a purpose. And installation is important. You want to make sure that there are no gaps between the panels. Say if you're using an MLB fence cover, they need to have a certain amount of overlap and it needs to be installed to the manufacturer's specifications. I've seen some installations where they don't bring the fence cover down 
to the playing surface, I'll leave a, a foot gap or sometimes two foot of gap at the bottom. And that just gives you two diffraction edges and a reflecting surface that allows sound to go right under the barrier. And that really degrades the performance. And, and yeah, and we've talked about sight lines already too. Sight lines are really critical because uh, if, if you can't block the line of sight, you can't shield that location. Uh, Marty, uh, you have a question? Yeah, how, how much attenuation would you expect from these uh, various barriers you're talking about? Um, it's it's going to depend on the site a little bit, but typically it'll be somewhere around 8 to 12 dB. When I say 8 to 12 dB, I'm really talking about insertion loss. It's the difference between before you install the noise barrier and after, uh, which is a little different. And, and the reason it's important when you're talking about noise barriers is that when you install a noise barrier, it blocks the ground wave, you know, if it's installed properly, if there's no gap at the bottom. Um, so in some situations, you actually have absorptive ground where the ground will absorb some of the sound and give you some attenuation just uh, by virtue of that. Uh, if you block the ground wave, you lose that. Uh, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it, it's a bad thing. But uh, if you have a, a reflective ground, like if it's a parking lot or something like that, then blocking the ground wave is a good thing because that's a reflective surface. And so the, the amount of assertion loss you get from a noise barrier, it will vary a little bit. So if you're putting it over absorptive ground, you may not get as much insertion loss as, as you would if you're putting it uh, like next to a sidewalk, you know, next to a parking lot or something like that. Uh, we also had um, one of our members talk about how her concern was that she lives 25 feet from a pickleball court um, and their city is showing, quote, good faith by installing the uh, acoustic fence. Um, it's been take, it's already been three months since the, 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 the soundproofing is not up yet. And she says every day is a torture and an uphill battle. I think we've already kind of discussed the fact that, that since there's second floor units in, in her situation, that acoustic fence is not going to work, right? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, like I said, if you can you know, stand on your balcony or look out your bedroom window and look over the top of that fence and see the players on the courts, then obviously that installing a fence cover is not going to shield you. And so that's, it, it sounds like they want to look like they're doing something, but they're, they haven't consulted with someone that understands noise abatement and noise control. Um, so, yeah, and I, I guess it, it's a nice gesture, but it's, it, it doesn't sound like it's in a situation where it's going to be effective. Yeah. Well, there is uh, a, uh... I mean, there is an installation in Mashpee uh, in my town, uh, a few miles away. Uh, acoustic fence, eighth of an inch, three sides uh, facing the houses, and I, you can swear to God that that it actually acts as a loudspeaker. Um, uh, the neighbor that uh, lives 250 feet away, 240 feet away, swears it got louder actually uh, after the fence was installed. So, I mean, there is no before after study. So no proof yeah. of that, but so I, I, I'm just, I guess I'm going back to what you say. It really depends on the, uh, the environment. A lot of that. Depends. Yeah, it, it does. And I would be surprised if it actually got louder, but. Okay, sure. Yeah. Like, it's, like I said, it, if you block the ground wave in certain situations, it can really have a detrimental effect. So yeah, it, it, if I wonder how many. Crazy, I wonder how many installations are just ineffective and not working because people just throw them up to appease the, the neighbors and they say, you know, this is a quote, uh, you got your sound fence, Ernie. What what do you, what more do you want us to do? I yeah. mean, that's, you know, so that's another, just mm -hmm. another layer of what we're up against. Yeah, well, you know, that happens a lot. And when I go to sites and inspect these installations, I find a lot of problems a lot of times. You know, sometimes they are well installed, but a lot of times, you know, like I said, there's gaps, uh, particularly at the bottom, but a lot of times they don't uh, overlap the MLV panels like they're supposed to. 
or there's some other issue, but but usually it comes down to uh, sound leaking through the MLB panels is, is usually the, the biggest problem. If I could add one more thing, sorry, uh, uh, it's, uh, is that, I mean, if you have a house that's 30 feet away, 11 feet away, 25, 70, 80, it really should just be a no brainer, right? Like we can't do this. This is not workable. We can't, it's either indoors or you have to move it. I mean, that would be, that would be an accurate statement, right? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what what I say in general is you know I would I like to see 150 feet because mm-hmm. that's the distance that I can usually work with. You know, if I have to go back in later and in, in design a noise abatement plan, 150 feet I can usually work with that unless there are other issues like the elevation differences or you have uh, multi-story houses close by where you just can't build a practical wall system that will shield that, then those will be exceptions. But 150 feet usually can work with that. In certain special situations, you might be able to get a little bit closer, maybe even approaching 100 feet. But those are kind of exceptional cases. But within 100 feet, it's just, it's very difficult. And it, I think it just even more than the loudness in the general annoyance that you would um, predict from uh, the ANSI standard is that there is also an issue of proximity. It's it almost becomes like that game you played when you were kids. Like you know, I'm not touching you, so you can't say anything. You can't tell on me, but you know, you know, they're holding your their finger an inch from your face. It gets to be kind of like that. It's almost claustrophobic. Just because it becomes such a distraction because it's like someone's behind you all the time. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Lisa, you have a question? Uh, well, my question was just answered. So thank you. I'm, I'm the, the person on this uh, group that is 11 feet from a court. Hmm. So basically you answered my answer uh, question that there really is no chance of abatement. Am I right on that? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, of course, I always want to look at the site before I say definitive, you know, I mean, you can't do this or, or that. He, but He's a sound engineer. He's got to play a little bit neutral, right, Lance? <laughs> right. I get that. I get that. But, but I think you're right, there. Lisa. Anything under 150 feet, I'll, I'll you tell might you. not be no, able to do impossible. abatement. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. But we're not experts. <laughs> Sorry, we have the experts here. So, Jacqueline? Yeah, the, uh, the question I have is, uh, Lance, do you know if anybody is working with USA Pickleball to develop guidelines? Because it seems to me that one of the biggest ways to solve this issue, kind of like how the NFL, once they acknowledged the brain injuries, they had guidelines and that changed. It seems to me that USA Pickleball needs to acknowledge this issue and come up with guidelines. Is anybody working with them? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, that's a good point because it, it really is damaging the sport. And I think a lot of people have lost confidence that they can work with the pickleball club to try to resolve these issues. Um, and so that's kind of led to a backlash where people just don't want pickleball anywhere near their house, period. Um, but yeah, I, 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 they USA Pickleball has not contacted me and I have not worked with them. I think uh, Bob Unitic has had some contact with them. I'm, I'm not sure how closely he's working with them. I think he's tried to make some recommendations. I don't know how far that's gone, uh, whether they want to ad- adopt that or not. I think uh, Rob and I can answer that. We Bob Unitic has been uh, bringing this to the attention of the board and He's also the rules guru in their monthly magazine, and he's the uh, chief referee this weekend with the adult games in Pittsburgh. They have 800 pickleball players. So he's really trying to work with the vendors, uh, manufacturers, and the, you know, the directors. I think we are gonna see some change, and um, Rob and I feel pretty convinced that we need to keep making our voice heard um, as, as this continues forward. He does. So, he does like to use LAF, um, and that's some of where the disagreement might be. But we're not here to debate that, right? That's right. 
Yeah. <laughs> Unless Lance wants to get on the next call, which is going to be on July 23rd, <laughs> and he can bring it to Bob directly. <laughs> so, uh, Lance, you've heard some of our questions, our concerns. How would you summarize, you know, what, what, we, what should we be thinking about going forward? Well, the, the biggest issue tends to be the, the lack of understanding in how to assess the noise impact of highly impulsive sounds. It, it's something that hasn't really seemed to come up as often in the past, and it, it's not really, you know, there's not a lot of agreement in the consulting field as to the best way to go about it. Um, there is still a large lack of awareness on the part of uh, city planners uh, as to the noise impact of pickleball. And it is still difficult to get them to understand the issue. And they have, you know, as a consequence, approved a number of noise nuisances uh, just because they, they didn't understand the issue uh, even in terms of understanding the difference between short-term and long-term noise impacts, uh, whereas you would have, you know, someone running their lawnmower for 45 minutes or an hour once a week is not the same kind of noise impact as an activity that goes on five or six days a week for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, and I a lot of them don't even seem to appreciate that. So a, a lot of it, uh, a lot of what I try to do is educational in terms of talking with uh, planners. And I'm working with the city of Centennial right now. Uh, it's a suburb of Denver, uh, trying to uh, increase their awareness in, in trying to guide them on how to uh, select sites for pickleball in terms of permitting and things to look out for that could become noise issues once the site is built out and, and things like that. Basically to improve the, the planning process and to take the, uh, the noise issue into account in a more quantitative and predictable way. Thank you so much, Lance. I mean, you are really, uh, uh, you saved us in Falmouth. I mean, you, you, you made uh, my world more sane because no one was listening to us. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. And you really, you solved a lot of problems for us. I think you brought us over that edge uh, that where people started listening. Uh, so we still have some ways to go, though. But thanks again. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you'd like to stay for another 15, 20 minutes or so, um, go ahead and join the breakout room and start your chats.